I want you to imagine something uh, truly mind bending. Yeah. We spend our entire lives orbiting one star, our sun, and we think we know our cosmic neighborhood. Right, our little corner of the galaxy. Now, imagine finding something that's not just from the edge of that neighborhood, but a massive object that started its journey billions of years ago in a star system, potentially billions of light years away. It's an event of, well, immense rarity. To date, we've only confirmed three objects that have successfully made that colossal interstellar journey and passed through our solar system. And today, we are taking a deep dive into the third, and I have to say the most baffling of those three, 3 I Atlas. That's our mission today. 3 I Atlas was first spotted on July 1st, 2025 by the uh, sharp-eyed astronomers running the ATLS survey system. And this visitor, in the brief time it spent with us, forced the entire astronomical community to, uh, you know, scribble furious notes and then basically tear up their textbooks. Yeah, and for anyone worried, it's now on its way out. It's following what's called an unbound hyperbolic trajectory past the sun, poses no threat to Earth. No, it passed us at a very comfortable 1.8 AU. So just to give you some context, 1 AU is the distance from the Earth to the sun. Right, so 1.8 AU is already cruising well beyond the orbit of Mars. But the key thing about 3 Alice, the thing that really sets it apart from its predecessors, 1 Imowa and 2 Aborsov, is its sheer scale. It's huge. Hubble observations constrain the nucleus to be up to 5.6 kilometers in diameter. That's the size of a decent mountain. Precisely. And that size makes it roughly 8,000 times more massive than the famously tiny cigar-shaped Umawua. And it's moving fast. Oh, it's motoring. It's heading outbound at over 60 kilometers per second. It's an interstellar speedster, and it's built like a tank. This is where the curiosity starts. Our goal in this deep dive is to unpack why this massive, speedy visitor is forcing scientists to question their very definition of a comet. It's a real tug of war. We're balancing the clear physical signs of a natural celestial body against a, well, a growing list of truly unexplained anomalies. I have to admit, when I first looked at the data, I just stopped and asked, where do you draw the line between a natural phenomenon and something engineered? And that's the question, isn't it? Here's where it gets really interesting. This object is acting like a comet that decided to ignore fundamental physics class. It absolutely is defying expectations. No. And not just in its size, but in its activity. Let's start with what the telescope saw early on, because the strangeness began long before it got anywhere near the sun. All right, we have to talk about their early activity. It was detected by NASA's TESS satellite. That's the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, yeah. And TESS spotted activity as early as May 2025, when 3ILS was a whopping 6.4 AU away from the sun. Which is way out past Jupiter's main orbit. For a natural comet, that is incredibly early to start outgassing enough material to be visible. And then as it got closer, the brightening rate was weird. It was baffling to scientists. When a comet approaches the sun, it brightens predictably as its ice turns to gas. We measure this rate with a parameter called alpha. Okay. Typical Oort cloud comets might have an alpha of, say, 2 or 3. 3 I Atlas's brightening rate exceeded an alpha of 3.5. So the higher the alpha, the faster it's turning on the brightness. Exactly. It was shedding gas and dust much more aggressively than any standard visitor from our own backyard. What does that suggest? Well... It suggests non-standard outgassing mechanisms. The fuel it was burning wasn't the familiar water ice we know and love. And that's when the James Webb Space Telescope got a look, right? To do a chemical survey. And the results from JWST just confirmed how exotic this thing was. The composition is truly, truly strange. JWST found that the coma, that's the object's atmosphere, was heavily dominated by carbon dioxide. CO2, yeah. not the standard water vapor. And CO2 is a much more volatile ice than water. Uh -huh. It sublimates, turns directly to gas at much colder temperatures. And the CO2 activity was persisting even when the object was way out, around 3 AU. Crucially, there's evidence it was actually suppressing the sublimation of water vapor through a process called endothermic cooling. Okay, that sounds like serious jargon. Can you unpack endothermic cooling for us? Think of it like this. When that super volatile CO2 sublimates, it sucks heat from its surroundings, including from the core of the comet itself. That's like a refrigeration effect. Ah, I see. It keeps the whole object so cold that even though it might be close enough to the sun for water ice to turn into vapor, the CO2 is actively keeping that water ice frozen solid. 
which explains the surprisingly low water content they found, only 4% water by mass, when water is usually the main ingredient in comets from our solar system. Yeah. The engine is just running on a different kind of fuel. Exactly. And speaking of exotic, that brings us to the nickel mystery. Right. Spectroscopic observations, which tell us what elements are glowing in the gas plume, found nickel vapor. Now, that's not too unusual in itself, right. but they found very little corresponding iron. And iron and nickel usually go together in space rocks, right? If you find one, you usually find the other in predictable ratios because they form together in stars. Correct. This specific nickel to iron ratio is highly unusual. And while some sources pointed out that this ratio resembles, you know, industrially produced alloys. Which immediately sets off some red flags. It does. But planetary scientists do have a plausible natural explanation. They suggest this particular ratio could be explained by the low temperature sublimation of something called metal carbonyls where metal atoms are bonded to carbon monoxide. So, okay, on one hand, we have this active gas-rich coma dominated by CO2 and maybe these exotic metal compounds. On the other hand, it's missing the most common ingredient, water. It's a strange mix. This combination of high activity and weird chemistry strongly suggests that 3 i TAS is a non-standard celestial body a visitor from a star system with its own unique chemistry. And the strangeness doesn't stop with the chemistry. Not even close. Okay, let's unpack this. Because if the chemical anomalies suggest an exotic origin, the physical anomalies you could actually see through a telescope are even more dramatic. We have to talk about what I think is the single most bizarre feature. The anti-tail. The persistent sun-facing jet. A standard comet usually has two tails, right? Mm -hmm. A dust tail pushed by sunlight and an ion tail pushed directly away from the sun by the solar wind. And an anti-tail is usually just an optical illusion. Yeah, where we're just looking at dust spread along the comet's orbit from a funny angle. But this was no illusion. No, this was a real persistent jet of material streaming toward the sun. A razor-thin jet observed for months on end, stretching hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Some observations had it stretching up to a million kilometers. Which is just mind-blowing. It's massive, over 620,000 miles. That's two and a half times the distance to our own moon. So this raises a fundamental physics problem. It really does. If the sun is constantly blasting material away with solar wind and radiation pressure, how does a jet pointing directly into the sun hold its shape over a million kilometers? It should be blown back instantly. Exactly. That's the heart of the paradox. Solar radiation carries momentum. It should act like a brake on small, lightweight dust particles. So for that jet to be so long and so straight and pointing sunward, the particles have to be different. The analysis suggests they can't be the usual microscopic dust grains. The particles making up that glow have to be much, much heavier. So they're too heavy to be pushed around by the solar wind. They must be. The model suggests the jet is dominated by particles with a radius larger than one micron, but smaller than 100 microns. This completely defies the expectation that a comet's glow comes from common micron-sized dust. It's like trying to make smoke stand still in a hurricane. It is. It requires a much denser, heavier particle than we'd expect. And that brings us to what I think is the real mic drop moment for this object. The wobble. The wobble. Observations in August 2025 revealed that this mysterious sunward jet wasn't fixed in place. It was wobbling. Yes, a clear processional motion. And it was incredibly stable. It had a repeating period of roughly 7 hours and 45 minutes. So by watching the jet wobble, they could figure out how the object itself was spinning. And that's what they did. They calculated the rotational period of the nucleus itself. And what did they find? A very specific, very stable rotation. Once every 15.48 hours, so about 15 and a half hours. And that's weird. Significant anomaly. This stable rotation behaving like a precision mechanism is just not what you expect. Most comets, after billions of years of random collisions and outgassing, are just chaotically tumbling. But 3 i Atlas is spinning like a perfectly balanced gyroscope. <laughs> it is. That's the unnerving part. It's moving like something with a fixed, stable axis, and the jet seems to be venting from one specific region, maybe near a pole. That's the implication. So you have the stable rotation, the heavy particles in the anti-tail, the exotic CO2 chemistry. If none of the individual parts fit the standard model, how do we justify calling the whole thing a comet? That is the central question. And it leads us right into the great scientific debate that's tearing the community in two. Rock or rocket? Let's start with the official consensus. Let's call them Team Comet. What's their strongest case for 3 i Adels being purely natural? The official position, championed by NASA, is that there is overwhelming evidence 
It's a natural object. It behaves like a textbook comet, just, you know, one from a completely different neighborhood. They have to address the movement, though. A truly unbound object should follow a perfect gravitational path, but 3 IAL showed slight deviations. The non-gravitational acceleration, or NGA, you're right. So what's their explanation for that? Team Comet argues that these subtle deviations are fully explainable by the rocket effect, basically anisotropic outgassing. Those CO2 jets are acting like little directional thrusters. So even the mysterious movement is just a natural result of its weird composition. The complexity doesn't demand a technological answer. Precisely. And this is where cometary scientists have that famous quip. Comets are like cats. They have tails. Yeah. And they do precisely what they want. I love that. Their argument is that variability is normal. 3 Aetilis simply represents an extreme rare type of comet formed in a different stellar environment, maybe one that was much colder or much richer in CO2. It's bizarre, but it's all within the realm of possible physics. But then you have Team Anomaly, and they look at the data and say, the universe has a terrible sense of humor if this is all just a coincidence. And they focus on the statistical anomalies that really strain belief. And the statistics are, well, they're compelling. The first point is the trajectory. Yes. Despite coming from deep interstellar space, its path is uncomfortably aligned with our solar system's ecliptic plane. That's the flat plane where all our planets orbit. Wait, so if it came from a totally random star system? Its path should be random. It could come in from any angle. It should be, yes. The calculated chance of an interstellar object aligning this closely with the ecliptic, just by random luck, is about 0.2%. That's highly unlikely. It is. So either the universe is cheating the statistics, or there's a pattern we don't understand yet. And then there's where it came from. The arrival point. Uh -huh. It came from the direction of the galactic center, a massive, dense star field, which made it really difficult to spot until it was quite close. We were looking through so much stellar clutter. And finally, the connection that generated the most buzz outside of the journals, the, wow, signal. The famous 72-second radio burst recorded back in 1977. So what's the connection? Well, calculations suggest that at the very moment that signal was recorded, 3i Atalas was positioned about 600 AU away, but perfectly aligned with the signal's origin point in the constellation Sagittarius. That is an incredible coincidence. It is. Now, this hypothetical link would require a transmitter powerful enough, somewhere between 0.5 to 2 gigawatts, to send a signal that far. That power level is... Well, it's feasible with near-future human technology. But the idea remains highly speculative. But it's the kind of provocative connection that forces you to look. Right. To look for techno-signatures. And we did look. We deployed the best tool we had for that job. The Breakthrough Listen Project. That's right. They pointed the Green Bank Telescope at 3 i at the less during its closest approach to Earth, about 168 million miles away in December of 2025. And they were listening for very specific things. Narrowband radio signals. That's the classic calling card of technology, as opposed to just random cosmic noise. So what was the definitive finding? Did we hear anything? Officially, the conclusion was no credible detections. They did identify nine initial signals that looked promising, oh. but all were later ruled out as human-made radio frequency interference, or RFI. Basically, the signals came from Earth. So for now, radio silence. OK, so let's bring this all together. What does this all mean? We've looked at this interstellar object with exotic CO2 and metal chemistry. A mysterious, sunward-pointing jet of unusually heavy particles. And a stable, gyroscope-like rotation, all wrapped up in a trajectory that seems statistically impossible. And the truth is, for every physical anomaly we've discussed, there is a complex physical explanation rooted in exotic comet behavior. It just pushes the known boundaries of physics. But even if it is a natural comet... It's a completely new category of object. It's a time capsule from another star system, estimated to be billions of years old. Yeah. And it's forcing us to expand our definition of natural. And 3 Iapolis is now accelerating away from us, moving incredibly fast. It's heading toward a close approach with Jupiter in March 2026. Right. It's passing near Jupiter's Hill sphere, its sphere of gravitational influence, at about 0.357 AU away. So we get one last look. And space agencies like NASA and ESA will use this close passage to test their models to see how these fast movers interact in dynamic gravity fields. It's a vital test of our grasp on these interstellar speedsters as they leave our influence for good. But the real shift is what comes next. We are left with this incredible object, and our technology to find more of them is about to explode. And this is the forward-looking thought we had to leave you with.
as large-scale survey programs like the Verici Rubin Observatory begin full operation. With their immense high-powered cameras, the expected rate of discovery for these interstellar visitors is set to increase by two orders of magnitude. We are talking about finding a new object every few months instead of one every few years. So what new normal are we about to discover? If we're about to find dozens of these objects annually, and the first three were already pushing the boundaries of physics, what happens when the fourth, fifth, or fiftieth visitor truly breaks the mold? What happens when we find an anomaly that even the most creative cometary physics just cannot explain? The surf has just begun, and the universe is about to get a lot more crowded.